Happy Sunday and welcome to Chasing a Murder. Today we are on part 115 of Life Beyond the Grave, which is attached to the Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell case. Guys, we're getting there. Can you believe it? And I've got some quite interesting and surprising information to share with you guys on this episode. Where did we leave off? We left off at the end of June. Charles and Lori, they're just not doing too well. Lori's in Phoenix in her new rental home. Charles, who is actually having to go back and forth between Texas and Arizona, will stay in a hotel whenever he does come to visit Lori and JJ. At this point in Lori and Charles' relationship, according to Kay Woodcock, anyhow, uh, Charles has got divorce on his mind once again. But it seems that Charles is being used for whatever Lori can take him for. In fact, we are learning that Lori isn't even worried about setting up a new home for Tylee or JJ. Instead, she's just kind of living out of the box. In a later interview, in a few weeks from now, Tylee kind of describes the house that they're living in and how the entrance of their house doesn't even have furniture. It's just full of mirrors. Uncle was staying in the room that's kind of like the guest room. If my room's right here, that's right there. Okay. And then... My um, little brother's room, and then kitchen's kind of back here, so it's like a little hallway, and then right here is kind of where everything happened. Okay. Like the big, you walk in, and then... Like the great room, kind of living room. Yeah, right now it just has mirrors up, because my mom wanted a dance room, okay. so... Yeah. Okay. Kind of unconventional, but... Okay. Whatever makes you happy, it's your guys' house. You can see by uh, Tylee's reaction, describing the mirrors in the entrance room of the house, She's not real happy. She's kind of embarrassed by that. But it basically tells you where Lori Vallow's priorities are. It's like she's going through a second teenage uh, midlife crisis. And let me tell you, Chad Daybell is only kind of adding fuel to that fire. It's around this time, well, the beginning of July, that he starts writing a romance novel about his sweetheart, Lori Vallow. And Chad is being very useful to them when it comes to clearing out bad spirits or to giving priesthood blessings. And on top of uh, every paranormal in the book that these guys have, they're adding to it, especially Chad, by telling Melanie that he was able to detect listening devices in her new home. In fact, he detected three of them. Where are all these bad, dark spirits coming from? Well, Brandon Boudreaux, of course, at least according to Chad Daybell. See, Chad Daybell and Lori Bello are not happy with Brandon Boudreaux. Brandon will be one of the most iconic enemies to Chad Daybell and Lori Bello. Why is it that they hate Brandon Boudreaux so much? We'll find out in a couple of months. So I did mention that novel that uh, Chad is writing. But we're going to go into that probably the next few series that are coming out because it's around July 13th that that novel really starts to kind of hit the spotlight and come out in the open where he shares it with Lori and his love for Lori and how um, these two were spiritually drawn together and meant to be together. Christina Atwood would say that she, the last time that she actually saw Lori in person would be around June 10th. I just wanted to stick that in there. Meanwhile, Brandon Boudreaux and Melanie Boudreaux are going through a divorce. They're finalizing the last bit of it, and it's going through mediation. He testifies in the summer of 2023, and so I'm going to share that with you guys. Um. And so we uh, we met with, I found a mediator after consulting some people and hearing that that would be the lowest conflict way to divorce. I tried to follow through with that. So we, we went through that process and um, uh, that, that started, um, I can't say exactly which day, but one of probably around the 1st of July. Um, and then um, did you complete... Um did you continue working on the divorce and separation through that summer and fall? I did, yes. Okay. Um, 
And where were you living in the end of September and beginning of October of 2019? Um, at, at the end of September, I was uh, selling my house, my home that we had bought together. I had moved uh, Melanie to a rental property. Um, and uh, then I, as soon as I sold my house, I got a rental property as well for the time being just to try to create some stability. I um, rented a property right back in where my old ward was, where I had lived before. Okay. Um, and so how... So Brandon jumped ahead for us a little bit. I'm afraid that I might miss putting that in, so I'll go ahead. I left it in there because we're approaching the fall here shortly anyways. So during this time, Melanie and Brandon, they're separating, they're processing this divorce, and they're trying to make arrangements to sell the house and this kind of thing because Melanie will actually get a nice settlement from this divorce. I mention this because Lori Vallow will be depending on that money to come from Melanie Boudreaux. Lori is manipulating her own niece for her own selfish needs and wants. And this includes, in my opinion, the process of building a temple, the temple of her dreams, at least to build this 144,000 and pull people together on this massive piece of property. Later on, um, at the 1st of July into the middle of July, it's somewhere in there that Alex Hawks takes a week off from work. And somewhere around this time, Melanie is talking to her Aunt Lori about Charles dying and how much life insurance Lori will get from that. In the same breath, in an interview, Melanie mentioned how Lori tells her that Charles is coming down from Texas with plans take her life for her life insurance so in the very beginning of um, July we're hearing talk of insurance money and lives being taken now is to make sure that everybody understands that Charles is a zombie and that Charles spirit is no longer here on this earth that is important for Lori to get across to these people and in a um, testimony by one of the investigators in the summer of 2023 for Lori Bellow's trial. He shares some texts that they're writing around this time. Being gone, hopefully today or tomorrow. The following day, 3-10-2019, Alex sent Lori a message. Love you too. Have fun and get rid of Ned already. 3-26-2019, Alex sends Lori a message. Ned is still alive. Just confirmed. Lori responded on the same day to Alex. It's not Ned, and it's a new one. Through your investigation, were you able to determine who Ned was that they were referring to? So at the beginning of this investigation, or in the following weeks, I apologize, the following weeks, we were informed that uh, Charles was possibly murdered as a result of being a dark spirit um, or a zombie. Uh, we did uh, receive information that uh, and through Charles's uh, contacts and, and uh, conversations with especially Lori, he mentioned that uh, he, she would refer to him as Ned or Garrett. So uh, those were names through the investigation. We found out that, Ned, that Charles was being referred to or the spirit in Charles was being referred to. So jumping back to March, these text messages insinuate that, you know, Charles is still alive somehow. So does that mean, you know, there was things, attempts on his life at that time? Or are they talking spiritually? We don't know. Lori and Chad are starting to become quite known for their uh, past lives, their teachings, zombies, castings and even stepping over the true prophets of the LDS. Julie Rowe, who had recently been attacked and excommunicated from the church, comes out with a podcast around this time, heeding warning of people like these. If you listen closely, you will get clues as to what she knows during this time 
and what's going on with these people because it's not just Lori and Chad she's talking about. She's talking about several other people as well. Julie mentions that these are wolves and sheep clothing and that she's known about these people for about five years. So this is in 2019. So a lot of these teachings that are coming to light right now, this is something that she seems to have known about five years before it really starts to hit um, to the point people hear about it, recognize it, or know about it. Fractured groups throughout anywhere from Napa, Idaho, Greater Rexburg area, the Salt Lake Valley, Utah Valley, San Pete County, Colorado, Arizona, including Snowflake, Boise, Idaho. I'm specifically naming these places because you guys know who you are, and I want you to know that I see you. I've had many of these groups try to contact me in the last five years to get information out of me to use and abuse or to otherwise rope me in. Many of these factions or groups or trolls that are on the Internet have tried to spread, spread lies about me, which have led in part my excommunication. I stand as a witness and testify, of you, uh, testify to you that I'm innocent in the accusations that have been made, made falsely against me at church headquarters and therefore, thereby by my state president. I stand by that. I am not apostate. In fact, I'm here to call out the apostate. And in part, my excommunication actually has provided a form of protection for me so that I can do this without fear of repercussion anymore from church headquarters and those that are within the ranks of the church, both male and female, who have been conspiring, some of them conspiring against the prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and others within the Quorum of the Twelve. This will come to fruition in the next several years, as you guys will see, the truth I speak will unfold. We've got groups everywhere from wealthy businessmen in Utah that are connected to the church headquarters, that are doing projects with them. PR firms, marketing firms, and others who contract out with the church. We have members, members and non-members who work on our temples, who are uh, not doing good things in our temples. Everything from the construction level on up to participating in satanic ritual abuses in some of our temples. I expose and reveal this at this time, and essentially could say I'm calling you out you think you're getting away with it, and there's at least one person who is mortal on this planet who sees what you're doing. I so what Julie's talking about there is she believes that there's people in there practicing, uh, using the temple to practice um, teachings and beliefs and even pray to things that are not attached to the almighty God of light. She believes they're using it for dark reasons, and boy, is she correct. How would she know this? Did Chad tell her? Did she do it at one time? We don't know. Because she's right. Lori Vallow and her little group of women, especially, meet at the temple doing dark deeds that are not of the church teaching. The church doesn't even know about it. Let's listen in more. I stand by the truth that I know, which is that I have a mission to be a warning voice on several levels, layers, realms, and dimensions, both on this planet and throughout the universe. And I testify to you that I work on behalf of the Savior, Jesus Christ, even our Redeemer. I work on behalf of Father, who has commissioned me to come to the earth this time, to condescend and to help, fulfill his purposes. I hope you hear me say that I have no fear of the adversary because I put my complete trust in Father in Heaven and in our Savior Jesus Christ, who again I testify is our Redeemer. They have a beautiful plan they're orchestrating. My mission is just one piece of the puzzle, but it's significant enough that it will awaken some of you who have been doubting some things about me, and you will come to understand at some point in time when you were supposed to awaken that we have some things coming, some of which I've warned about and some of yet I have not yet disclosed. 
There are both members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as well as non-members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who have been, are, and will have continuing revelation, both of sight, hearing, and feeling, various forms of dreams and visions, as well as visitations from the other side of the veil. I'm not alone in this. We all have very unique missions. We made premortal covenants to come to help awaken the souls on both sides of the veil, and specifically those in this celestial realm, to the day at hand. We are in the last world of this eternal round prior to the Lord's second coming. I witness and testify to you that he is and will come. That he is the savior of this world and many other worlds in multiple locations and multiple places in the universe. He is our king of kings. He does and will rule and reign and he will take his rightful place on this planet. No matter what Satan tries to do, no matter what those who work with him, including Cain, or any of the other Council of Twelve on this side of the veil, or the Council of Twelve on the other, or the Council of Eighteen or Twenty-Four, or Seventy-Two, or One Forty-Four, something I want you to bring to your mind is that it's been testified by living prophets and apostles in past days that at one point in time, some point in time in the future, the Church of the Firstborn will be started, the remnant will gather, and they will go into New Jerusalem to prepare the way for the Savior's return. I witness and testify to you that this is true, and that there are breakoff groups that are developing right now within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who are being given false revelation about the Church of the Firstborn. Some of them are taking active roles knowingly that they are deceiving other people, and some of them are just being deceived by false spirits. I witness and testify to you that it is not time for the Church of the Firstborn to start. And if there's anybody talking to you about that, that has started a church or a group in secret or otherwise, they are being deceived by false spirits. False spirits who pretend to be John the Beloved or Enoch, false spirits who pretend to be Christ or Mary Magdalene or anyone else, Peter, James, and John. If they're coming to you saying that they can bless you with translation, that they have ordinances for translation, or second anointings, or second comforters, and they are not directly tied to President Nelson, or working in the temples of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, related to a second comforter, which is or excuse me, second anointing, which is different than second comfort, or second comfort is when you actually see the Savior. Second anointing is an ordinance that on occasion can be administered in the in the temple, but it's very rare. There are a handful of cases. There are groups that have come to my attention that have contacted me in the last five years that have tried to get me involved uh, with blessings, claiming that John or other people have come to them, Peter, John, they... They're being told that they are the reincarnate versions of these individuals. Multiple probations is a true doctrine. At some point in time, Eric and I will be talking more about multiple probations. I witness and testify to you that both Peter, James, and John, all three of them, are not on this planet. John is a translated being. He does administer. He works on this planet, but he is not a mortal. Peter and James are not mortals, they are on the other side of the veil. They have been mortal before, they are not mortal now. If you come across someone who claims they are Peter, or James, or Hiram, there's also another individual that was brought to my attention about five years ago, who claims he is Hiram reincarnate. He is a false spirit, he is a false prophet. I know who Hiram Smith is, and it is not that individual. Same with Noah, Gabriel, Michael, or any of the other archangels that are disclosing themselves to groups of people or individuals claiming that they have special knowledge or understanding to be passed down. One of the adversary's biggest tools that he comes to people, uh, works on their ego and pride, makes them feel like they're important with, quote-unquote, some kind of special mission. And you guys are going to say, well, that's hypocritical because of what I say about my mission. I stand by my mission, you guys. 
and yet there are false spirits talking. They, they try to talk to me too. One of the reasons that I know I speak truth is because the false spirits were some of the first ones that started waking me up to my mission, and I would ask the Lord, and then he would send a true messenger. There are different ways to discern true messengers from false messengers. Everything from voice intonation to facial expressions. Now, there are some people that watch the radio show with Steve Minton with Eric and I, and it's gotten back to me that uh, some people on the Internet said I looked dark. There are reasons for that. I was in the presence of dark spirits who clouded the camera. There was bad lighting there. I want you to look in my eyes when you watch that video. I want you to feel the energy. There are false beliefs that have been passed down in generations regarding everything from psychics to future telling to energy work, and that's for a reason. And so those issues that you guys have, again, I'll tell you the same thing that I told from the very beginning. The only voice you can trust is the Lord's. you got to take it to him. You can hear my words. You can watch me on video. You can come to the classes or hear this podcast. Ultimately, the way you discern truth is to take your questions to the Lord. If you're not getting an answer, then you need to ask different questions. Or it's just not time for you to know that because that knowledge makes you accountable. Julie Rowe just mentioned the fact that knowing this information holds you accountable. This sounds familiar to something that we heard, those of us that follow this case closely. Who knows who said that besides Julie Rowe? Leave it in the comments below. So here you got Julie Rowe in the summer of 2019 warning people about this group, groups like Chad and Lori. And she seems to be referring a lot to Chad Daybell. Now, Julie Rose says something that I think is kind of important, and that's where you, she says, death isn't a big deal. This is a problem when you're dealing with people like Lori. Six percent dark is our ratio, give or take, I don't know, several million. Uh, for every light that comes or dies, a darker light comes. So, like, if we're at that point, they'll let you know the level of darkness. And don't you find that interesting that at least two-thirds of the planet is going to go to the other side of the earth. Now, those aren't lights or darks, all of them, right? Just because somebody dies doesn't mean that, that a dark is taken off the planet. It just means that we're going to have a huge shift on what goes on in this planet. And I look at um, death as, oh, depending on who you are and what side you work with, of uh, a gift. It means you graduated from your moral probation. If you work for the life side, you graduated to get to go on to the next level of eternal progression. And even if you're on the dark side, you still get a chance to come back and try to do it again or improve or break contracts or whatever. So I don't look at death the same way I used to. I used to get depressed at seeing what was going to happen on the planet to loved ones that I know. Uh, I still am working through the grief of what I see coming with people close to me and and even just you know trafficking situations and everything all this darkness very very dangerous um thing to teach people i think uh especially religious people that basically you can be dark nothing's gonna happen you're gonna be fine you just get to start all over again so even if you're light it doesn't matter if you die you know you're gonna keep going you're still here so it, it's kind of scary and this makes you understand a little bit more why Lori takes death so lightly. Okay, so let's go over a few things here. So we hear um, Julie Rowe mentioned 144,000 and how we're not at that point that we're building the 144,000 yet. This was one of her topics that she has talked about often on her podcast. But she's reaching out and telling people and warning people there are groups out there that are collectively um, pulling in members of the 144,000 and that it's in progress and it's happening right now and it shouldn't be. Julie claims that whatever's going on with that gathering of the 144,000 is probably attached to Satan or evil or darkness. I think I forgot to mention, I'll mention it real quick is Lori, ha I'm sorry, Julie has spoken of astral 
projection. Something Chad Daybell also has um, admitted to being uh, very interested in. In fact, he believes that he was able to do uh, astro projection in front of his family one day in the kitchen. Around July 5th, around 11.35 p.m., Zalima texts Lori, it's time for the signs of the coming of the Lord. This is interesting. It's not they see the signs of the coming of the uh, Lord. They're, it's time for those signs to start happening. So let's see them begin right now. So around this time, uh, too, Charles is talking to his landlord, Joe. And Joe had actually shared a lot of information of what Charles was going through around this time um, during an investigation interview. Last we left off with Joe as he said that he was making arrangements with Charles to find a place for him to rent after uh, finding a house for Lori and JJ and Tylee. Much wisdom needed to be done. And then Charles would go on his trip again. But then, um, so that you have some history, at least from last year. Um, but then on, on that sun, Sunday or Monday, before he came back into town, the Thursday before he was shot, Charles and I were communicating. And he was telling me, I can't be at the house. Do you have another place that I can live? Well, by that time, I had someone that was living in my studio apartment at my house. Because Charles was like, I only need it for like a week, a month, maybe a few days, because I'll be coming and going. But I want to be close to Lori and JJ because I you know, don't want to be patriot. And he goes, but Joe, I can't stay at the house. I can't stay at the house. Lori and I, you know, we've got several things to work through still. And it's not good. And I just don't want to, I don't want to crowd that space if she's going to be there. I want her and JJ to be comfortable at the house. So I have a neighbor that was right across the, the, the my walls, our walls connect. A big house in, uh, right near my house off of Wigan Riggs. So I went over there. I called him. I said, hey, you've got a casita. I've got a business guy that's here, to, here once a month, one week a month. And I took pictures. And this guy, he lived in Hawaii at the time. And he said, yeah, here's the access code to my house. I went over there, took pictures of the, of the casita. I sent them to Charles. Say, hey, Charles, my friend, my neighbor here has this place. You know, he'd be willing to let you stay there. And Charles was like, fantastic. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. So he was already planning to not be at the house with Lori because it just wasn't good. Um, when was he planning on that? The, 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 the condo or the other thing from your neighbor? So Charles is starting to slowly understand that things were not going to work out between him and Lori. So um, around July 6th, around 8.48 p.m., Lori sends Zalima a text DNC, the ceiling power. So in between all of this, Charles is still um, talking to Adam Cox. That he's planning on trying to get Lori some help. And Adam is like, look, I'll try to do what I can, but I don't know what we can do. Um, we know that Zalima and Lori and all of them, they think that they can use uh, the elements of the earth, like earthquakes, in order to control some of the situations uh, attached to several people they claim that are dark or carry uh, demons. So one text on July 8th, Lori to, to Zalima at 1.22 p.m. Ask if we can call up a CA earthquake for tomorrow. Hiplos will be heading there tomorrow in Valencia. Sadly, he's still okay but we are going to continue to work on him. The elements will obey eventually. So it sounds like they're calling on earthquakes to help them and that they've done it in the past, but they've not really worked for them. She's saying we just keep on calling and eventually they're going to work. On July 9th at 4.39 p.m., Salima to Lori. Okay. And it was my fear that things will roll out fast for now on so remember these guys they have portals in their homes and on july 8th at 6 19 p.m salima to lori i had to get home so i could go in my portal out there 
I asked if we can do that and the ramifications of the things to come, we are not ready for it at this time. From what I understand is that when Hiplos goes, things are going to be a domino effect, one after another. What do we need to do to be ready for all that is coming? Sometime during all this, and this is another area where I wasn't able to update very well, um, Charles Vallow is trying to do an intervention for his wife, Lori. Adam Cox is on board, and Lori Vallow has gotten a hint of some of the plans that uh, Charles has made to try to get Lori help. And how is Lori getting that information? Well, through her mother and several family members. The same people who enabled her that could have stopped all this from happening if they had just listened to Charles during this time. Lori Vallow has been talking to Summer about this. She has requested that Alex Cox, her brother, stand by her for protection. And Summer agreeing with Lori that would probably be the best thing to do. Because right now, Lori's spreading a lot of gossip. That Charles is coming down from Texas to take the life of Lori for her insurance money. What she doesn't say is how she and Charles have made plans for Charles to come pick JJ up and take him to school. In fact, Lori is certain that she's going to get rid of this mole in her side. She will say in the text that basically while thanking her brother Alex thank you for standing by me it's all going to come to a head this week so basically it sounds like hey we're going to be done with Charles we won't have to deal with this any longer just let's get through this week okay guys I'm going to stop it here I'm in a hurry today I want to say thank you so much for those of you who have been very supportive to this channel I love you guys and I'll see you guys soon